On Tech News Today, critics say Google is exposing kids to deceptive marketing. Plus, a new camera wants to replace both your drop cam and your GoPro. And a former Uber executive launches what could be called the Uber of ride sharing. Wait, what? Stick around, and we'll explain everything. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, April 7th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 50-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I'm Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Our co-anchor today is After Nine's content czar, Joe Panettiere. How you doing, Joe? Mike, I'm doing great. How have you been? I've been great, thanks. Now, we're going to just jump right into something here. Madonna is debuting a music video as we speak on, wait for it, Meerkat. She introduced her most recent music video on Snapchat. This time, Madonna plans to introduce the video for her song, Ghost Town, and we hope that's not a commentary on Meerkat's popularity. Let's check in on the material girl uh, and the debut, debut of her new album, Now in Progress. Currently delayed. All right. Well, great, uh, great start there. <laughs> that landed with a thud. Yes, it should start soon. So there you go. Uh, you know, Meerkat is a is a small company, and they're hosting a big uh, star, and so it all went south. Um, if that comes up again, if you see anything move on that page, um, let's jump back into it and check it out. I guess the content isn't really important. The fact is that she's trying to do it, but we'll see. We'll see how she does. Uh, yeah, do we have any B-roll from Desperately Seeking Susan or anything like that? I think that? we probably can do that, uh, as long <laughs> as it's not on Meerkat. Well, in our top story today, consumer and child advocacy groups say Google's YouTube Kids app involves deceptive marketing aimed at children under the age of five, and they're asking the Federal Trade Commission to investigate. The app launched on iOS and Android in February. Elizabeth Weiss is a reporter for USA Today, and she joins us now. Welcome to you, Elizabeth. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I didn't pronounce your name right. It's Weiss, isn't it? Thank Geese, yes. Yes, okay. Well, thank you so much for joining, and uh, sorry for uh, messing up your name. Now, before we no get worries. into the news, can you tell us what YouTube Kids is and how it works? So, basically, it is, a, it is an app that you download, and I've actually talked to parents if you, it's, it's you can kind of, you know, it, it, it basically runs an endless stream of short videos that are mesmerizing for <laughs> kids under the age of five. I mean, it's you look at it as an adult and you're like, you'd really have to be on some serious drugs for this to be fun. But if you're three, it's great. Mm. Uh, I've talked to parents who love it. It's a, it's a curated series of channels on this app uh, that Google's put together. They've got some nice parental controls so that you can make it so kids can't search and get off of the app, which is useful because if they're in the back seat, it's surprising how quickly they can end up places you don't want them to end up. <clears throat> it also allows parents to put on a time lock so that kids can only watch it for a certain amount of time. So when they launched it, they got a lot of kudos for creating this child-friendly space where parents could relatively confidently hand their phone or their tablet off to the kids and know they weren't going to end up and suddenly be Watching something that their parents didn't want them to be watching. Now we're, they've had about a month and a half in, and now we've got these uh, consumer groups, and it's led by the um, group Democratic Media, but there's a bunch of other groups, the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Uh, there's a 
uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Children Now, Consumer Federation of America, Consumer Watchdog, and Public Citizen. And what they're saying is, when you look at the content that's on this ad, it's all one huge long commercial. And what they're saying is that since the 1970s, the um, FCC has overseen children's programming. I mean, anybody who grew up and wa grew up watching TV knows that the number of ads per hour in kids' programming is limited. It's, uh, I think it's 10 and a half during the week and 12 minutes per hour on the weekends. It's also um, the, uh, you're not allowed on TV if you say have a My Little Pony show you're not allowed to have an ad from My Little Pony during that show because the idea is that, and they've done, there's been a ton of research done on this to show that kids, especially under the age of five, they just don't have the ability to distinguish between an ad and programming. And to them, it feels like, oh, My Little Pony is saying I should be buying this My Little Pony thing. And, and so, so the FCC came down and said, don't do that. But online, so, uh, uh, there are no Elizabeth. Rules. Yeah, I was going to say, Elizabeth, do those rules, those do those TV laws and regulations apply here in the online world? What's the early reading on this? That they, so far they don't. And that's the issue. The FCC is only concerned with broadcast media. Clearly, an app on your iPhone is not broadcast media. And so what's interesting, and this is going to be interesting to watch as it progresses over time. This coalition of groups didn't go to the FCC, they went to the Federal Trade Commission because the Federal Trade Commission is involved in um, uh, advertising. And what they're saying is we have, we've had 40 years of regulation from the FCC's standpoint on how we regulate advertising to kids. The FTC now needs to move that to the online realm and look at what are we allowing people to market to kids. Now, Google, it's its kind of an interesting back and forth that Google was sending me emails this morning because they were saying, we don't, uh, we feel like they're just trying to shut us down and that it's not fair that good content shouldn't be available to people. It should only be available to people who pay for it. Well, you could say the same thing. About, I mean, it's all paid for with ads. What this coalition is saying is the same rules that we've put in place for media aimed at kids on television should also apply to what we're aiming at kids online because that's where they're moving. There's a ton of research out that shows that kids today, I think 17, last year there was data that showed that 17% of, the, I mean, these are three-year-olds are watching an hour a day just on little screens, tablets and iPhones. So that's really where it's moving. But right now, and this is the coalition saying this, it's the wild west, there's no regulation. What is Google's response to all this? I mean, they're being accused of lots of uh, things here. Uh, what are they saying? They're saying that when they set up the app, they worked with a lot of child advocates. Uh, they feel confident that, confident that it's appropriate, though they did say they were happy to talk to anyone who wanted to chat about it. Um, and, and they're also making that, they're trying to make it a case that Advertising has to pay for these things. Otherwise, you would have to put it behind a paywall. And the only way to really make it available to everyone is to have something like this, which is ad-supported. And so they they had this, it was an interesting little way of saying it, that, you know, we don't feel that this should only be available to those who can afford to pay, which is a little bit of a disingenuous argument because we pay for broadcast television with ads. I mean, there's no reason that these couldn't also be regulated. The question is, how, how would you do it? And who would oversee it? And presumably that's good. These, this group at least thinks that should be the Federal Trade Commission. We don't know yet what the Federal Trade Commission is going to say about that. And the other problem, of course, is that YouTube videos cross every border. Elizabeth Weiss is at USA Today, and you follow her on Twitter at E. Weiss. Thank you so much for joining us today, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Let us know what you think of all this by sending us an email to tnt at twit.tv. We want to hear from you and whether you think the FTC or the FCC should be regulating YouTube content like TV. Got some more news in a sec, but first let's talk about Gazelle. Gazelle will buy your used gadget and uh, they'll buy all kinds of stuff you might not uh, expect them to. For example, they buy things like Apple computers like Macs and MacBooks. Uh, they will buy even an old iPod if you have an old iPod, believe it or not. And it's really, really easy to sell 
to Gazelle. You just get a free offer. Go to the site, uh, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. Uh, just indicate the condition and they'll send you a box. You put it in the box and off it goes. You get paid fast. You can choose from options like buy check, buy Amazon gift card, and buy PayPal. It's really a fantastic service. In fact, um, ABC uh, News said that consumers are blown away by how much they can get and usually more than they expect. And that has been my experience as well. It's just a fantastic service. But now, now they will sell you a device directly. You can choose from one of two condition categories. One is certified like new. The other is certified good. The certified like new ones are just like brand new phones, except they're less expensive. And certified good have some gentle signs of wear, but they give you a really, really great price. And of course, they all work perfectly because all devices have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection to make sure they're fully functional. And, of course, they're backed by a 30-day risk-free return policy. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. Well, the new app organizes carpooling among employees who work at the same company. It's called Ride, and the app launched today on iOS. Doug McMillan is a tech reporter for The Wall Street Journal and joins us now to talk about it. Welcome, Doug. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Now, Ride looks a lot like Uber, but there's a good reason for that, isn't there? Uh, yeah, this uh, app actually has a, a lot of roots in Uber. One of the people who designed it, its name was Oscar Salazar, who was one of the very first engineers at Uber. He's actually employee number three after Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp, the co-founders. Um, Oscar Salazar is the guy who really built a lot of the early technology behind Uber. Um, he's been called in to help work on this new carpooling app called Ride. And the other connection to Uber is that it's majority owned by TPG Growth, which is one of the big investors in Uber. So it's an interesting kind of play on carpooling and a lot of connections to one of the biggest names now in carpooling. So how exactly does Ride work? Yeah, so it's an interesting twist on this whole car carpooling concept. The, the main difference is that it's all focused on employees in the same company. So basically how it works is the company signs up to work with Ride. They advertise the service to all their employees. And then the people who want to sign up, it groups them together into carpooling groups based on where they live and based on their schedules when they go to and from work. Uh, and then essentially it finds the person at the farthest geographic point of that chain. And usually this is kind of aimed at people in the suburbs commuting into um, you know, a big uh, company in the city, um, and it, it designates that person the driver. That person drives along the route, picking up each passenger along the way. And one of the b other big differences between Uber and Lyft and this new app Ride is that you're not, they're not actually paying the driver a commission. The, the, each passenger essentially just pays um, uh, part of the costs that the driver entails. So the, the Ride app comes up with a calculated cost, it divides that uh, between the, the riders. And the, the riders are essentially paying for things like parking and tolls and gas and vehicle maintenance that the, that the driver will um, occur, incur. So it's actually kind of an interesting new twist. And, you know, Uber and Lyft have been using this term sharing economy a lot. But this is actually kind of more of a, a fitting description for, you know, a situation where somebody is sharing their car with their, their fellow workers on the ride to work. Now, what if I'm the person farthest away from the company and my car can handle three passengers plus me, the driver, uh, but what happens if there's six or seven or eight people between me and the company? So this is the sort of interesting part that I'm, I'm not totally sold that this is going to work, but what they are doing is that they're trying, to get in, they're trying to get that person to steadily add more and more people until their car is full. And then when their car is full, they're actually offering to lend them or lease them, no all expenses paid, um, a new full-size van. So the Ride has a relationship with General Motors, and they are getting access to a lot of these full-size van vehicles. So they're offering to basically give you, to, to let you borrow uh, a full-size van when you do kind of hit capacity and you want to expand that group. I'm not sure, you know, specifically... For, if it was me, if I would want to keep picking up more people, I think that people might get kind of happy with the group that they're in. Uh, but it's an interesting kind of step-up progression model that they're trying to work with to try to expand within these companies. 
Hey, Doug, I'm going to date myself just a little bit here. M Mike and I worked for a media company back in the 1990s that tried to do uh, ride sharing among their employees. And, and it was very, quote unquote, progressive back in the day, but it never really took off. I mean, people have different schedules. Sometimes they don't like sharing their car. Is there any sense of just how far we've come and, and, and how open minded people are to this approach? Or is it going to be super niche, do you think? Uh, I think it's an interesting idea. There are a lot of new um, concepts in this area. Um, you know, Uber and Lyft are both really focused on their Uber pool and Lyft line carpooling options. I think that they see that as a big opportunity to get more people into cars. And certainly when you think about kind of the environmental impact and people's greater awareness of, you know, driving around with a lot of empty car seats. Uh, and also, you know, just, just uh, being able to ride in the carpool lane for a lot of people, um, you know, fulfill, fulfills a big need. Um, there are also, you know, a lot of other different concepts at play here. Google bus um, is a concept that, you know, is no longer just confined to Google. Those gigantic, you know, buses, apparently they cost like something like $700,000. A lot of the biggest tech companies are investing in these Google buses to get their employees to work. Um, and then there, you know, in within the city of San Francisco, we're seeing more and more of these kind of shuttle and, and large, um, you know, smaller bus options for, for, for get, getting people from, you know, condensed urban populated area down to the financial district. I think that there is, um, you know, a new um, emphasis on getting people to work. And I think that probably more and more people, at least within cities, are giving up their cars. Uh, where this new ride app kind of plays uh, best, I think, is in suburbs, where you really don't have um, a lot of the Uber or Lyft or Google bus options. And most people are just kind of confined to having their car to drive to work. So perhaps this is a new play to get more people who work and live in the sub suburbs to give up their car or at least try carpooling to go to work every day. I have to say that that is an impressive set of records and, and record player behind you. Uh, <laughs> that is just amazing. Did you put that together like recently or have you been hanging on to those since you were in uh, preschool? This is the regular rotation right here. <laughs> wow. Look at that. <laughs> that is awesome. Very, very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, Doug, uh, Doug McMillan uh, can be found at WSJ.com. That's the Wall Street Journal's website and also on Twitter at DMAC1. Thanks for joining us today, Doug. Thanks, guys. All right. Let us know if you want to carpool to work using an app like Ride by sending email to TNT at twit.tv. I'm curious to know whether you would be up for it if you just like driving your own car. Well, the mobile, mobile payments company Square is adding something called Square Marketing to its bevy of services. Ruth Reeder writes for VentureBeat and joins us now to talk about it. Welcome to you, Ruth. Hello. Now, can you tell us about this new suite of Square marketing tools? Sure. So basically today, uh, Square rolled out a suite of tools that are aimed at customer management, right? Some of those it already had. Um, it rolled out a feedback survey, which is just an opportunity for customers to sort of like give their feedback on a business. And they also have a customer insight tool, uh, which basically gives businesses aggregated anonymous data about their customers. Uh, and from what I understand, those two things sort of existed already, um, but they're being rolled into this, this suite, right? And the newest addition to that suite is Square Marketing. And what Square Marketing is, is a tool for sending out uh, basically email campaigns, whether that's like an invite or promotion or a newsletter. Um, they're giving businesses, small businesses specifically, access to something that they would ordinarily have to buy separately. Um, and by rolling it into its register, um, it's basically allowing those tools to play off of one another. So you have more customer data that way, right? So you know who's a returning customer, who's been away for a while, um, who is like a super customer, somebody that comes in daily, uh, and and that allows businesses to better target their emails and offer promotions based on that information. Hey, Ruth, is this like a small bu business version of Salesforce.com, or does it fit more along the lines of like a, a pumped up version of MailChimp for email marketing, or is it a little bit of everything? I, I know I'm trying to box you in in terms of a particular category, but maybe the point is it, it does a lot of everything. Yeah, I think it does both. Um, I've compared the the Square marketing to Mailchimp. I think it's like that, but like bigger. Or what did you say? <laughs> you were on steroids. Um, yeah, Mailchimp is essentially the same service, but it doesn't 
tie into like your register or your sales or anything that it sort of like right. operates independently. Um, and so I think what, you know, when in, in Square's uh, blog about it, I think it said something about like, it's a closed loop, right? So basically you're able to use all of this information in tandem. Now, how do they monetize this? I mean, how much does Square marketing cost? Square marketing will cost, so the two features that I mentioned initially, the uh, customer insights and the feedback are both free. I think those were available initially, so they're going to continue to make those free. But what they're going to charge for is Square marketing, the email service. And uh, small businesses will have to pay 10 cents per email, or they can do like an unlimited package. And I believe it's $15 for uh, a collection of like 500 consumers um, and they can pay $30 a month for a collection of like a thousand. Ruth Reader is at VentureBeat.com and you can follow her on Twitter at Ruth Reader. Thanks for joining us today, Ruth. Thanks for inviting me. All right. We've got a little bit of breaking news for you. Uh, BuzzFeed is actually reporting an exclusive that says that Google plans to get into the home services business to compete with Amazon. Amazon uh, recently, last week actually, launched a new uh, um, product or service called home services where they uh, they list plumbers and so on they guarantee their work uh, and now it looks like Google is getting into something similar I also want to check in on Madonna apparently uh, that thing is still dead in the water let's take a look at what people are seeing when they go to the Madonna meerkat site boom 500 I don't <laughs> it says oh no something went wrong this is the this is the fail well of meerkat so there it is they can't handle it they can't handle the material girl that this is not going to happen anytime soon, it looks to me, at least until a lot more people wander away out of boredom of, after looking at a big 500. Well, you've heard of home monitoring cameras like the Drop Cam, and you've heard of action cams like the GoPro. Now a new product called the FLIR FX, a FLIR, FLIR, something like that, FX, does it all. Nathan Oliveras giles is a reporter for The Wall Street Journal and joins us now. Welcome to you, Nathan. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Now, how do you pronounce this product? It, it is FLIR FX. Yeah. FLIR FX, okay. Like, like FLIR, like the baseball cards, basically. I see, yeah. okay. Uh, okay, so the FLIR FX sounds ambitious, but you said it's got a killer feature. Can you tell us about Rapid Recap? Yeah, so there's this really cool feature called Rapid Recap, and what it does is the camera basically has a motion sensor inside of it, and whenever it senses anything in front of it, it actually starts recording. And what it does is inside of the, the app on, you know, Android or iOS, you can compile all this together and see all of the events that happen in front of this camera throughout the day. So they're overlaid on top of each other and you'll see, you know, multiple people or dogs or whatever kind of moving all at once, almost ghosting over each other. And this allows you to see essentially, hopefully, an entire day's worth of footage in minutes. So it's a really, really big idea because... You know, if you got a camera and you have to sit there and watch 24 hours of video, that's just not really going to happen. Now, where do the actual videos live? Do they live locally or up in uh, the FLIR, the FLIR cl cloud, excuse me? Yeah, FLIR has a cloud service, of course. I mean, they want, they want you to become a paying subscriber. Uh, there is a free option that comes with every camera and that gives you uh, the last couple days worth of footage and uh, three rapid recaps a month. If you want to pay 10 bucks a month, that goes to seven days. Uh, and unlimited recaps. And then if you want to pay 20 bucks a month, it goes to the last 30 days with uh, unlimited rapid recaps. Uh, in talking with the company, they did say, you know, if you were a free customer and say you're on vacation, you, you leave the house for 10 days and someone breaks in, they will, you know, essentially kind of move you up to that little tier temporarily so you can go and get that footage. So they are holding on to it for a while, whether you are, you know, a free customer or a paying customer. Um, but your access to, you know, that footage really depends on what subscription level you have. Of course, uh, as you pointed out in your article, uh, if you go somewhere, you're probably going to want to take that camera because it's also an action cam and then there's nobody watching your house. Now, um, what do we know about the video quality? What, for example, is the resolution or uh, the viewing angle? Yeah, so it can shoot up to uh, 1080p. Uh, and it, it'll do that in its sport mode. So basically, if you have it out and you have it um, mounted into a dash cam or into like a little uh, uh, clear plastic case that you can attach to a helmet or something like that, it'll shoot up to 1080p. When you're using it in your home, uh, it, it downgrades a little bit because it just doesn't need that level of resolution. So I think it's actually uh, 720p there. Um, and it shoots at a, a very wide 160-degree viewing angle. So you can really get a nice kind of big 
big wide picture. So, you know, it, it, if you're going to go snowboarding or, you know, river rafting or take it to a skate park or something, you should still get a pretty pleasant shot no matter what. And hey Nathan, tell me a little bit about pricing and availability. How much is this thing going to cost? When can I buy it? And then where do you see it fitting in the market versus GoPro and others? I mean, the thing that's interesting to me is, is giants like Cisco Systems used to have all these cameras and then they abandon the market and GoPro comes along and, and really builds the market. And now you have these new startups. So when can I actually buy this camera and where do you see it uh, fitting in in the price levels? Yeah, sure. It's available for pre-order today. And so it sells for 200 bucks, and it sells for 250 when bundled with a, an outdoor housing that kind of protects it from the elements, uh, makes it waterproof and all that stuff. And that outdoor housing has an extra LEDs for even longer distance uh, night vision. I think it's like up to 65 feet, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, as for, oh, it, so yeah, it's on pre-order today. It's going to be shipping in, uh, in, in a couple weeks through like Best Buy, Target, Home Depot, lots of big box stores as well as online retailers like Amazon and B&H &A, and all that stuff. But as to where it fits in the market, I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of crazy. It's, it's essentially the same components inside of a GoPro and, and a drop cam as, as is in this camera. So from a cost effectiveness uh, standpoint, FLIR, they're really trying to get their name out there to consumers. They, you know, they're, they've, they make more than a billion dollars in revenue selling thermal cameras every year. They're huge, but they don't really have a mainstream consumer presence. And this is their attempt to change that. So, you know, it's an interesting idea. And it's cool that it's both kind of, you know, serving the function of a GoPro and a drop cam. But, but just as Mike said, and as I mentioned in the article that I wrote, if you're going to use it at home, but you're going to want to use it on vacation too, you're going to end, have to end up buying two anyways. So the versatility comes in. Um, I think there is a market for it. I think the appetite is there because both GoPro and drop cam and, and others are successful um, at serving these niches. But, you know, I guess it's going to come down to marketing and whether they can get people to buy into their ecosystem versus, you know, buying both a GoPro and all the other things that are out there. Well, it sounds pretty cool. I think I, I want at least two of them. Uh, Nathan <laughs> Oliveira Skiles is at WSJ.com. You can follow him on Twitter at NateOG. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. We told you yesterday that Turkey had blocked access to Twitter and YouTube over photos of a hostage event. Now the sites have been unblocked after those sites followed Facebook's lead in removing the offending images. Both Facebook and Twitter plan to appeal the court's ruling. And Joe, you know, this is really an interesting case because, you know, they've, they've done things that have been terrorism related. That's basically how they're categorizing these pictures. They're pictures of terrorist acts and they want to, to remove them. And even after removing them and, and obeying the sort of or, order by the Turkish government, uh, they are going to appeal it because they want the right to maintain pictures like that on these uh, services. Of course, that'll probably be shot down in the Turkish courts. But it is an interesting, uh, it is an interesting thing that, you know, uh, Turkey has, I guess the, 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 the thing that strikes me is that Turkey has so many reasons for blocking these services. They do it, they did it because, uh, you know, lots of people were criticizing the government and pointing to evidence the government was in, and, and people around the government, including uh, the, the prime minister's family, were engaging in, uh, you know, bribe taking and stuff like that. That was one reason they did it. They did it because of terrorism. They did it because of this, that and the other thing, uh, decency. And so, um, you know, they just got a million reasons to, to order, uh, you know, to basically take down these social networks and then order them to remove uh, photos as a condition for bringing them back into the country. Yeah, you know, I th and I think this is just a uh, reality worldwide. I think every government at this point would be pushing to take down and or block services, even the U.S. government for that matter. But, uh, you know, Silicon Valley and, and the, the cause for freedom here in the U.S. is so forceful. Uh, we push back against those things. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're in a dangerous area here where um, it's really tricky, particularly for the service provider, to decide what is uh, viable content and what content should be taken down. Where is that line drawn? And and then also, what algorithms, if any, are you writing to, to draw that line and automate all this? So uh, just a little scary, obviously. Uh, and, and it's a continuing story, especially as... Uh, uh, you know, ISIS and other things continue to proliferate. I also, uh, my personal opinion uh, is that I think that it's very uh, ill-advised for, for governments to take down images like this. The assumption is that if you show acts of terrorism, that everybody's going to want to be a terrorist or something. It supports the terrorist, a, a terrorist win or whatever. 
But I think it's just as likely that people will see these things and decide to oppose terrorism more forcefully in their political actions. Uh, and so you you know they're trying to they're they're trying to you know tailor public opinion, but that's something you can't really uh, predict where it's going to go based on what people see and what their experiences are online. So I just think uh, it's a, probably a good idea for them to leave as much content online as they possibly can and just let people form their own opinions. But that's my two cents. Well, streaming video service Hulu today launched a, a GIF search engine powered by Yahoo's Tumblr. The site is called The Perfect GIF, and it features short animations from TV shows, which are given hashtags that include Hulu, plus the name of the show and subject matter. Uh, this is a kind of shameless, don't you think, uh, Joe Panitari? I mean, here they are jumping into the GIF craze. They're using the fact that they have access to all these TV shows to just generate GIFs so that you don't have to do anything other than just pick one and off it goes. Uh, yeah, and I think the really interesting uh, angle here actually is, is the fact that you mentioned it. It's powered by Yahoo's Tumblr. Now, you and I have, have spoken multiple times in terms of uh, what exactly is Yahoo doing with Tumblr? How are they going to monetize it more effectively? How are they going to police it more effectively? This may be a clue in terms of, of how they're going to scale that engine and maybe monetize it through licensing deals, et cetera, or access deals. I don't know what the financial arrangement is here, but I think that Tumblr hook is quite interesting. Okay, another product update is that Apple Maps now includes reviews from TripAdvisor and Booking.com on select hotel listings, which ends Yelp's reign as the sole source of such content on Apple Maps. And of course, if you're using Apple Maps to get turn-by-turn -turn directions, we still don't know for sure whether you end up in the bay, but... Uh, <laughs> But this is an improvement, and they, uh, you know, Apple, in fact, is working very, very hard to catch up with Google Maps. They've got a long way to go, and uh, this is one example of them doing that, and it's bad news for Yelp as well. I was actually in a restaurant the other day, and, and uh, the restaurant uh, owner was lamenting uh, the fact that on Yelp, they will actually, you know, sort of press you for, uh, to, to advertise if you're small business, and if you do they incentivize you by saying that we'll take down some of the negative reviews Ooh. and i thought wow that can't be true and i looked it up and apparently this is a widespread practice and it's widely understood that yelp does this and i was kind of shocked at that um it just sounds really really shady and apparently it's legal so it does sound shady and and um you know i i've been disappointed to hear those rumors as well especially since i, I have to admit i am a yelp fanatic i travel a lot on business yeah. and I, I you know also travel a lot uh visiting family down in uh the southern u.s i'm on yelp every day when i'm traveling i absolutely love it and it, it, there's always been this this uh big debate about whether there's a way to take down the negative reviews and, and to hear this is um quite disturbing to say the least yeah well, one other uh, product update, uh, Snapchat has dumped its best friends feature, which was a list of the people you interact with most frequently. Instead, it's added emojis to show Snapchat relationships. For example, a gold heart emoji means your best friends. A smile emoji means a person is one of your best friends. And a smirk emoji means that you're their best friend, but they're not yours. <laughs> Jeez. Snapchat also added a low light mode for the camera. They're doing, they're working so hard to keep anyone over the age of 15 from using this thing. Unbelievable. Well, and I'm speechless, obviously. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Me too. I didn't even want to talk about it. Well, in mergers and acquisitions news, French media giant Vivendi has made a takeover bid for the French video hosting site Daily Motion. Terms were not disclosed, but the price is probably around $272 million, which I believe is 250 million euros. Both Yahoo and this week, the Hong Kong telecoms group PCCW tried to buy Daily Motion, but those acquisitions were opposed by the French government because they wanted to keep Daily Motion owned by a French company. The mobile phone group Orange has a control, controlling stake in Daily Motion, and the site has about 128 million monthly unique visitors. And this is the oldest news we've ever reported. Apple acquired the search startup AutoCAD long ago, possibly in 2013, when AutoCAD suddenly closed. That company's technology now powers the Explore tab in Apple's App Store, and the acquisition and integration have been kept secret until now. Well, we got some more news for you coming up, but first I want to tell you about ZipRecruiter, which is the best way to hire people ever because what it, you know, the problem with hiring people is that the best and most qualified candidates are everywhere. You don't know where they are. So ZipRecruiter will let you with one click 
go out to all the places where the most qualified candidates are so you cast the widest possible net. The other pain with hiring people is you get so many unqualified responses and it, you know people just figure well I'll just throw my hat in the ring and see if they you know make a mistake and hire me even though I'm not qualified for the job that happens all the time people want the job even if they're not qualified and ZipRecruiter will help filter the qualified from the unqualified candidates and so you only have to go through the qualified candidates the candidates that meet your criteria. You can customize your branding. You can add multiple users to your account at no additional charge. You can create an instant job page on your site. It's super professional and super easy, and it's the most powerful way to hire somebody. You've got to try ZipRecruiter. And right now, our listeners and viewers can try ZipRecruiter for free. Plus, get 30% off your first traffic boost. That's a great feature that it really uh, puts your, uh, it's like steroids for your job search, by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. Well, in courtroom drama news, a Manhattan Supreme Court has ruled that a Brooklyn woman can serve divorce papers to her husband on Facebook. Eleonora Baidu was granted permission to send divorce papers to a hard-to-find husband whose name is Victor Sena, wait for it, Blood Dracu, via private uh, Facebook message once a week until acknowledged. According to Slate, though, there is precedent for serving precedent for serving legal documents through Facebook. A New York family court in September allowed a man to send his ex-wife a child support notice via Facebook. And there you have it, Joe Panettiere. I think this is a this is a setting a, a second precedent that you can uh, do legal documents over Facebook. And, you know, it had to happen at some point, I think. It had to happen. And I'll tell you what I think the next precedent will be. I think Facebook's going to find a way to monetize this. What, why would they allow <laughs> this type of really, really mission critical commerce to to occur over their network without charging a fee for it? They're going to find a way to do it. It'll be part of the relationship setting. So instead of, you know, it's complicated <laughs> or whatever, you could just say divorce and then it'll start the process of actually divorcing the person. Wow, what a world. Well, in human resources news, former Android chief Andy Rubin, who stepped down as head of Google's Android group in March of 2013 and left Google altogether in October of last year, has joined Redpoint as a venture partner. Ruben has also announced yesterday that he's founding a company called Playground Global, which helps technology startups make consumer hardware. He also announced that the company has raised $48 million from Google, HP, Hanhai, and other tech companies, as well as Redpoint, of course. Ruben has had an amazing career so far, working as an engineer at Carl Zeiss, Apple, General Magic, MSN TV, and Web TV. He then went on to co-found and head both Danger, Inc. and Android, which was acquired by Google it's been about 10 years now. Uh, Joe Panateri, this guy has had an amazing career. He's probably really rich uh, from all of these, uh, you know, and, and, and he had to have been lured away for some really cool stuff to, to basically, uh, you know, I think Google is trying to keep him by throwing all these robots at him saying, yeah, just buy all the big robot companies and you get to play with all these robots. And uh, even that wasn't enough to keep him at Google. Uh, so anyway, interesting guy and, and what an interesting career. Interesting guy. And, and the thing I love about the story is he's focusing on hardware. You know, I think we've all become so obsessed with cloud and, and apps over the last few years. It's great to see this hardware renaissance going on, especially among the venture capitalists and angel investors out there. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got one more in the realm of human resources department. We reported to you last week that HCC designer Jonah Becker had left the company. But now we've learned that he's joining Fitbit. As, a, as VP of Industrial Design, sounds to me like he was poached. In the Research and Development Department, Stanford University eggheads have invented an aluminum smartphone battery that sounds almost too good to be true. It can be charged in one minute, and it's also long-lasting, safe, flexible, and cheap. While the current state-of-the-art smartphone batteries can be cycled about 1,000 times, the new Stanford battery tech could continue after more than 7,500 cycles without loss of capacity. Wow. The researchers wrote about their findings in the journal Nature. This is mind-blowing, Joe Panettiere. If they can get this thing to market, this is going to change everything. It's mind-blowing, and you almost want to see who from Apple and Google and others are signing in on the campus directory there to go check out this technology and, and possibly productize it really fast. And I'm hoping Apple uh, buys it, uh, buys the company, <laughs> if nothing, uh, if no other reason than to hear Johnny Ive say aluminium one more time. Well, in big numbers news, 50 
That's a percentage discount Apple employees will get on the Apple Watch. That's a pretty nice discount. It's a discount, but is Apple still turning a profit on each one of those sales? I mean, the Apple Watch margins seem pretty high, so I wonder if they're still uh, getting some profit off their own employees. They probably, if I know Apple, they probably are, and it's probably worse than that. The Apple employee is going to probably go to the store with his blue shirt and say, I want to buy one of those Apple Watch, and they're like, got to make an appointment. you got 15 <laughs> minutes to pick it, and then out the door. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Ali Reza, who posted this picture on Google Plus and said, this is how we do it in Iran. That is a uh, tech news today on a tablet of some kind on a uh, running uh, treadmill. There you go. Look at that. Very nice. Get your exercise and also exercise your brain with tech news. Awesome. We love it. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Joe Panettiere, what the heck is happening at After Nines? Oh, well, Mike, we've got a good problem. We've got a backlog of great podcast interviews. So we're taking two live this week rather than just one. Uh, if you check out afternines.com slash CEO later today, you will see podcast 29 and 30 up there. We've got teasers up there right now for 29 and 30. Go to slash CEO there. And basically, podcast 29 is going to be um, Silicon Harlem describing how you can start a business in the New York area and how they can help you. And then the other podcast is with Tracy Houston, who is a board of director expert. So if, if you're a startup tech business and you're trying to figure out how to build your first board of directors, Tracy's going to help. And that's afternines.com slash CEO. Fantastic. Sounds great. Uh, Joe Panettiere, thank you so much for calling in today. We'll see you next time. All right, Mike. Thanks. Take care. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on iTunes and please leave a review and let us know how you like the show. And you can choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plugin of your choice, which you can find at twit.tv slash apps. If you're ever in California, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Come hang out with us in our Google Plus community. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find the community. And you can also follow me on Periscope. Just tap the people icon and search for my name. Let us know what you think. Send us an email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. Don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.